your eyes and imagine the smell of rain on morning earth, fresh brewed chai, blooming peonies in a well-tended garden. Can you see it? Almost taste it? We use our senses to create home, the place where we feel joy and belonging. In life's journey, what we think of as our home evolves. We build new homes from our dreams, sacrifices, and journeys of miles and years. And for Indianapolis immigrants, home goes by many names. I'm Erica Irish, and in this podcast by the Indianapolis Public Library, we're learning what home means to Indy's immigrant community. Through their diverse lived experiences, we'll see how, rather than exchanging an old home for a new one, immigrants create a powerful new idea. That home is so much more than a place. My guest today is Mariam Silla. Um, I met Mariam when she was in high school. Yeah. I think you were a junior? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> at Northwest High School, yes. which is where I also went. So that was a really nice yeah. connection. Yeah. Um, just before, just to start, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, where are you from? How long you've been here? So my name is Mariam Silla. Like you said, um, I am currently in my master's here at IUPUI. I'm studying public health with the concentration in social and behavioral science and the focus on maternal and child health. <laughs> oh, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> very good. And I am originally from Guinea Conakry. It's like a small country in West Africa. And I moved here in 2013, so about eight years ago, maybe. And yeah. <laughs> very, very nice. Um, because this project is related to a place, It's the title is A Place to Call Home. When you think about the concept of home, what is the first thing that comes to mind or what comes? So to me, a home is a place where you feel comfortable, you know, a place where you are not living in fear of whether it is rejection, discrimination. So I think definitely Guinea is my home. And I found a place here also in the U.S. that I call home. But that's because of the people around me, you know. So sometimes it's kind of hard being an immigrant in the U.S., but you also, if you find the right support system, you know, you can call it home. Do you think you've found that support system? Yeah, I think since I came um, in the U.S., you know, having even you to help me do my FAFSA, <laughs> I remember. So those are like um, good support systems for me, you know. So that's kind of how I created a little home for myself here. Cause, but it's not the same thing for everyone. It can be very challenging, but... Um, yeah, you just have to go for it and find the right people. Um, and before arriving here to Indianapolis, what did you know about this place? I just was like, wow, I'm coming to America. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming. The whole country. I know, because, you know, what they show us on TV and even what they show them here is different. You know, they show the bad part of Africa here. Mm -hmm. And then there they show like, Oh, America is the dream. Yeah. So, yeah, it can be a dream, but uh, you can struggle, you know, getting to where you need to be if, like, you don't find, you know, that support system that I'm talking to you about. But what was that, um, the images you had about Indianapolis being in the U.S.? So What did I, you think it was going to be like? I pictured it, you know how in those movies they showed those big buildings, big yeah. cities, everyone is dressed nice, everyone has money, <laughs> you know, you don't have to work to blow your mind or kill yourself every day to get money. So it was like the perfect life. So I was like very excited. Plus my parents were here. So I was like, this is a perfect opportunity I've always dreamed of. So, yeah. So your parents were here already? Yes. And then how long were, were, did you, were you without them in Guinea? So my dad, um, he left in 1990, no, in 2000. Okay. Yeah. At the so end of 1990. years yeah. maybe? So he left and then my mom left in 2003. Okay. And I didn't see them till 2013. So it was hard, you know, even com 
trying to come here and all that. So because I remember you have you have younger siblings. I do. So were they born here and then yes. you met them when yes. you got here? Yeah, three of them were born here. Me and my sister Ami came and my other sister Fatima stayed in Guinea. She's also here. So we are currently all here. Everyone's here now. Everyone is finally. here. So that's good. But three of my siblings were born here and for the first time I saw them. And then my little brother, he was three. He was like, oh my God, I can't believe you're here. I was like, telling my mom what is he saying <laughs> <laughs> it was like so emotional to see them you know i bet it was a long time you were it and was. who were you with in guinea my grandmother okay yeah my grandmother um i grew up with her and well i grew up with my parents at some point too yeah. and um all my cousins so what was your journey then to get here since you came with ami yeah so ami and i left guinea we went to belgium Okay. You know, my uncle lives there, so we stayed with him because, like, it was also hard to get visa from Guinea or like anything to join our parents here. Okay. So um, we went to Belgium and then we stayed there for a little bit and then we tried there and it ended up working for us and we came here to get the visa to be able to come. No, we got the visa in, from Belgium and then we came here. Okay. You know, at at one point we we weren't even planning to go to come here. We just went there for school. We were like, okay, it's better. Just let's stay there. And so is that where you finished high school first? Yeah, I, I did. I finished high school three times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you have three, three diplomas. I did. So one I from do. Guinea. One from Guinea, one from Belgium and one from here. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> A triple. Yes. Triple diplomas so, from high school. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, your parents were here already. How did they choose Indianapolis or why? Why? Here. So what my dad told me was when he came, he lived in ATL with his brother. Okay. And then one of his cousins who lived here was like, hey, maybe you should try Indianapolis because it's a little bit cheaper than Atlanta and you're by yourself, especially if you want to bring all your family here. My little brothers weren't born then because my mom wasn't here. And so that's how he moved to Indiana. And then your mom connected mom. with him here in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. and then your brother, your siblings were born here. Yeah, and, and then, then my mom came through, I think, New York, and then my dad picked her up. And, okay. yeah. and do they like it here? Yeah, they, they like it, actually. They, well, the reason why they like it is because they got comfortable living here. You know, it's not because... They, my mom, for example, I don't think she would probably call your home because she's always like, I want to go back home. I want to go mm. back home, you know. So I think one thing that is holding her here is her children. Yes. You know what I mean? So sometimes it's like you want to go home, but like you can't because your children were born here and, you know, they have to go to school. You know, you have to take care of them. So that's a reason why my mom is like, OK, I guess I'm going to stay here. You think she's waiting until they're older and go to college and graduate and then she'll my be. mom is like she loves her kids like <laughs> she treats me like a baby i'm like i'm not a baby anymore okay but i don't i think it will all depend in the future i do see her traveling back and forth like if my brothers are more independent because my brothers are the little ones when if they're more independent i see her traveling back and forth i don't see her however leaving them here to go live in guinea <laughs> okay and then so you all live together right now so you're all, you're a very close family yeah we yeah. do a lot of stuff together we all live together now all six kids and our parents <laughs> <laughs> it's a full house and it's never quiet there <laughs> Um, and what is your connection now to your home country, to Guinea or to Konarki? So Guinea, um, I have a really good connection there, you know. So, you know, sometimes people come and then their whole family come because of different reasons, you know, and then they come here and they get disconnect disconnected. And then, so for me, it's like my grandma is there, my cousins are there, my uncles are there. So I also have a really good support system back home which makes it easier for me, but it's not for everyone because I talk to friends where they're like, well, I can't even go to Guinea because I don't know anyone. All my families are here. You know, they can't go back home um, because, like, there is nothing there. There's nothing for yeah. them to go back to. Yes, there is nothing there. So for me, it's like it's good. I have been thinking about 
working there maybe like five, six years from now, uh-huh. um, moving back there. That's my that's my goal because like what I'm studying right now, I think it will help a lot of people be back home. And even with that, I start I start like applying that knowledge here in Indy with like immigrant communities and African communities in general. So yeah. Wow. So are you already making connections to what potential jobs that you could be doing back? Yeah. Back so I went back there in December. Uh-huh. I, yeah. <laughs> it was so fun. I stayed for two months. Yeah. And um, public health is a growing field and it's like, it's help. It's going to help a lot in Guinea if we have more people who practice public health. And so I went and I looked around. I saw a lot of jobs that I'm interested in. Like um, my dream job is to work for UNICEF, you okay. know, or USAID. And that's a big deal there. You know, that's what I told my mom. I was like, when I graduate, I'm going to move to Washington. That's what I want. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like Washington is like... It's a big city for someone who wants to learn public health. So, well, we can talk a more a little bit about your future plans later because okay. I do have more questions about yeah, all your no future problem. projects okay. that you you're doing. But going back to when you maybe arrived, um, how was it to adjust to school here, especially now learning that one you were very mature for your age. I remember. Yeah. Because you had already graduated <laughs> yes. twice, yes. and then here you come to Northwest High School. Um, how it was challenging. Why or what? It was very very hard adjusting at Northwest. You know, like I, when I think about it, it makes me emotional sometimes. But the kids, they were so mean. <laughs> they were so mean to us. You know. So, especially my sister and I couldn't speak English. So, like, it's like, how am I supposed to interact and make connection with these people when they're not even giving me the opportunity to get to know me? You know, they're always like, oh, you are not from here or, like, you're African. Like, you're different from us. <laughs> so, it, it's, it was, like, uh, it was kind of hard, you know. It was very hard. People will insult us in English and then other people will translate it for us, you know. So we had to also find our friends group. And it's so crazy how all our friends group were all immigrants. Yes, I remember. There were like people from like Latinx, Africans and Asian. Mm -hmm. It was just us, you know. We used to play soccer together. We sit together at lunch, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, I remember that you created a connection with like Ebuna. Yes. Um, and then I think the Sarmiento brothers. Yes. I, I remember yes. they were part of <laughs> your generation. <laughs> and it was all, it didn't, you were from all different parts of the world, yeah. yet you created your really little support system. Yes. yes. In a school that maybe wasn't that welcoming no, or not at all, <laughs> or didn't know how to support yeah. um, immigrant students. I even remember. When you complained about your ESL teacher. Yes. Um, because she was, what was she giving? <laughs> yes. So I we used to have this best ESL teacher. Her name is Miss Crosby. I actually talked to her till now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So I talked to Miss Crosby. Um, we used to have She was her. there for your first she year. She was there for my first year and everybody loved her. And then they brought this other lady <laughs> who doesn't know anything. Like she has no cultural understanding. Yeah. It seems like she never worked with diverse background of population before. And it was a very, very hard because she just was very dismissive of us. When we tried to ask her questions, she wouldn't listen. And like, if you are teaching like students, especially a language, you need to listen. If you're not listening to what they're saying, they're going to be afraid to talk. They're going to be, you know, afraid to listen to you. And for me in my class, I was not afraid to like talk to her and that bothered her a lot. All the other students were like in the shelf. They were scared to talk to her, but I was not. So that's why we didn't get along. <laughs> No, and but it was re- a challenge. <laughs> yeah, and I remember, I think one time, like, the ESL director came to Northwest, and I, yes. I was like, you need, just tell her what you're thinking, and she yes, listened to you, she and I think then they got rid of that teacher, yes. because she wasn't even teaching anything. She yes, was just, she wasn't teaching anything. And, and you were senior that year. Yes, I was a senior, and I was like, I need to pass the 
that exam the, that we have. the yes. end of course assessment yes so i yes. was like this is not helping you know yeah. And it wasn't just me, it was other people. It was challenging for them because we all felt like it was a year, like we it was a year wasted because yes. we didn't learn much, you know. I think it was so, like a full semester. Yeah, it was. That's another reason why I decided to take classes with Miss Bailey instead too. Well, I was taking both classes. So oh. at least I have a little bit of, you know, learning when I'm going to take my assessment. Yeah. But you did graduate. I did. And like the top of your class. I did. So. I did. And I just feel like now I'm more comfortable talking about it. Even being at top of my class, I couldn't be valedictorian because I didn't have a green card. So it was like literally the worst thing ever. I was devastated. I was like, what? Because I don't have a green card, I cannot be a valedictorian. They never told me my rank. Never. I went to get my transcript. I saw my friend's transcript. They have their rank. I never had the rank. They never put a rank? Never. I went there multiple times. I asked. They never put a rank on my my transcript. But um, I'm happy because my sister got to. Well, yes. by the time she graduated. Which was a year after you. Did. Which was a year after you. We had like a working permit at least. And so she yes. was able to be a valedictorian. But I remember you got your social security number when you were in a senior. No, it didn't come then. Was it your work permit? It was my work permit. And mm. I think it also came at the very, very end. Yeah. Um, yeah, it came at the very, very end after I, the graduation and everything got over. Because we used to go to do Saturday class and like, yes. try to do FAFSA and all that kind of stuff. So I didn't know that they didn't let you know. Yeah, that's why. Or give I, you a rank? They never. That's why I actually then. But who I, told you it was because of the green card? Um, the the advisor, the senior advisor. I remember her <laughs> name. <laughs> I remember her. I'll tell you her name. But I do remember her, and I remember that actually being a, a big problem because there were two substitute teacher. Mm-hmm. I forgot their name. I think it's Miss Morales and. I oh, the they're the assistants, bilingual assistants. Yes. So one of them even told me to go talk to the principal about it. I did, but it didn't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it didn't work out. And I remember her assistant, I forgot her name. She felt so bad for me. She even gave me a graduation gift. Yeah. Miss Hudson? Yes, Miss Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Miss Hudson. She even gave me a little graduation keychain and other because stuff. Because she knew you were the top. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't think I knew this. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I never actually really talked about it. You know, no. when you first come, you don't know the system. Yeah. You are scared because you're like, what are they going to do to me next? So you don't talk. And I'm sure you also were looking for your sister because she still had an extra year there. Yeah. Yeah. And she was, you know, I know she was working really hard. Yeah, she was. And it was it was good. She got to have the valedictorian scholarship, which I was really happy um, she didn't have to struggle her first year of college like me, you know. So How did you struggle here in college? So when I first graduated, I got accepted to Marion University. And it was very expensive and I couldn't get loan because like, mm-hmm. you have to have a green card or like some type of mm-hmm. U.S. citizenship to be able to you know, get loans. So I couldn't. And so thankfully, I, there were a connection at Walmart. I mean, Marion University and... He was very nice, and they accepted me not as international student, but but as a domestic student, mm-hmm. because then I had my working permit, I think, and so it was still expensive because Marion is a private right. school, you know. So I did try it for soccer, and um, they were like, "Yeah, it's good. You did good, but like for this year, it's filled. Maybe we can try next year, you know." So I'm like, "Okay, if we are, we are trying next year. How am I gonna pay for this year?" So I decided to go to Ivy Tech, and I worked at Walmart and Amazon. <sighs> when I think about it, I'm like, wow, I really did this. So you I worked at two Walmart. Two jobs yeah. and full time. When I was at Ivy Tech, my dad would pay, would help me pay. But like, it's kind of hard for him because he also has, you know, other children to take care of, a house and everything, you know. Because then my mom also wasn't working, and so it was a it was a struggle. And I started working more hours, like fifty. Like if they have overtime, I would work, and all my money would go towards my tuition. I always had late fees. <laughs> 
always had late fees. So after Ivy Tech, I transferred here at IUPUI. Same thing. Worked worked a lot of hours. Were you still working at Amazon and Walmart? Yes, I still work at Walmart. Okay. I had left Amazon because it was it was very far and it was it was a lot of work. I spent hours and it was affecting me mentally and physically too. I bet. I mean, yeah. you're trying to balance college in the U.S., yeah. which was very different from Northwest. Yeah, it was. Because, like, when I see the Northwest kids, I'm like, wow. Like, you guys have the opportunity to go to college. You guys can apply for FAFSA and get financial aid and go to school. But, like, they don't want to go to school. And I'm like, oh, and here I wish I could. You had to work two jobs <laughs> to be able to pay. You and- know, and then when I came here... Even having the working permit, that's something I think a lot of the immigrant community need, needs, need to know. Is like if you have a working permit, you are paying for tax. So you are eligible for financial aid. I didn't know that. So before I worked and paid for school, and then one day this lady was like, you know, you are eligible for financial aid. I'm like, what? What do you mean? And then she's like, just bring your documents and then we will help you. And that was here at IUPUI? That was here at IUPUI. And then I brought my documents and this, she called someone to help me with my FAFSA and we entered everything. I didn't have hope in all honesty. I was like, this is probably a waste of my time, but that's fine. At least she tried to help me. <clears throat> so we did the FAFSA and everything. I remember that summer I worked a lot at Walmart and I saved a lot. I was like, I'm going to just pay at least so I'm not having late late payment. And so I saved and one day I used to also take summer classes and do my homework on my lunch at Walmart. Mm. And one day I was just sitting and then I got an email saying I got FAFSA. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? I was like, no way. And I called my sister because, like, she she also didn't apply for FAFSA. She had finance, I mean, scholarship, but she didn't know what FAFSA was. So I called her, and she looked. She was like, "Well, if you have money in your financial aid, that's how it looked like." Now I don't know if you got it or not. <laughs> so that's how I got. I, that's how I got my first FAFSA, and um, since then, every year I apply for FAFSA, and <laughs> I make sure my sister also apply. Although she has, she had a couple scholarship, yes, but she still had a little bit to pay. So I made sure she also apply, and that's kind of how my success began because then I had more time to do things I like, like being involved on campus, you know, exploring, being in scholarship programs. So, yeah. yeah. So why? what was the main reason that you stayed here at IUPUI, or was it because of that involvement with so many different organizations? And how how did you become so involved? So... Honestly, I didn't want to come to IUPUI. Like, I was like, no, I don't want to go there. But I feel like if you came home, you know, because I remember, remember one time you came and we visited. Mm-hmm. I actually work in that office. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that space where that we, we did, used to yes, sit. where we did some poetry. Yes, with, yes. yes. I, I, my office, my little cubicle you, was there. We just moved it a few, okay. few days ago. And I was telling my boss, I was like, I came one time and this place was a lounge. I can't believe I worked here. <laughs> But um, IUPY just became home, you know, and I got involved. I found people here also kind of like the little connection I formed at Northwest. And here it was also more because there were like African Student Association. There were a lot of Africans, you know, there is like Latinx Student Association, a lot of Latinx, Asian, um, APIDA Student Association. APIDA, I think it's called APIDA. So what they had, oh, it's called... Asian American, Asian, um, Asian Pacific. Oh my God, I'm, I should okay. know that. <laughs> I know it's a lot of acronyms at yeah, college. It is. So like, and, we found that space, you know, at the multicultural center where like there is all this student organization, and then we we are all in the same you know room, mm-hmm. and everybody have their little area, you know. Um, and so that's kind of how I started, you know getting comfortable. But even with that, when I first came to IUPI, I was a little bit shy to go there because I was like, oh my God, this is a different level. This is not high school. Because high school, I, f- I kind of feel like I was the mom and everybody was here with me. <laughs> but this is college. Everybody's busy. No one has time, you know. So um, I made connections in my classes. I tried to 
not just get involved with people that look like me, but people that also are different with me because I want to know, like, why other people treat us differently, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there are people, good people are there, but there are people that... Ooh, it's hard to deal with. <laughs> yeah. And I think, was were, did you come here along with your sister? Because I we graduated together. No, I graduated first and then she graduated. Oh. I just stayed extra year. <laughs> <laughs> I just stayed extra year because I was like, well, if it's paid for, I might as well get, because like, I got a French degree too. Okay. So what's your undergrad is in French? It's in, yeah, French, uh, public health with a concentration in health services management. And I got two minor in health education and wellness coaching. So I was very interested in wellness coaching. Uh -huh. And since he was paid for, I was like, I can stay an extra semester. I mean, extra year. And I had also just got a resident assistant job on campus. Okay. And I really wanted to explore the campus life in Canada. You know, see if I wanted to be in higher education, how will I connect public health and higher education. But um, I didn't end up going to higher education because I just feel like no matter what you study, you can work in higher ed. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so that's why. Yeah. Place is made possible by the Indianapolis Foundation Library Fund through a grant to the Indianapolis Public Library Foundation. And I know I follow you on, on like Facebook and social media, and I know that you you made a really like snarky comment about oh I got accepted at IU Bloomington and I got accepted at IUPUI for my master's. Yes. Everybody, guess where I'm going. <laughs> Yes. And then you made the big reveal that you were you were gonna stay here. Yes. Why did you choose to stay here versus <sighs> IU Bloomington? I stayed here because um, IUPY is home. In all honesty, you know, I made a lot of connection here, and I think it's the reason why I think it's also time for me to leave because I'm getting too comfortable here. You know, yeah. but IUPY um, is just where I grew. Most, you know, I'm comfortable speaking a lot more and I've learned a lot of stuff, you know, that I didn't have the opportunity to learn before. And so when I was deciding to choose which university I wanted to, to go to, you know, COVID happened and then there is peer pressure. Everyone is like, mm -hmm. we all should leave. We all should go here. I had friends who, who went and then they came back. I was like, when I'm, I'm going to think about it. What options work for me? And so I talked to a lot of students at IUPY. And I reached out to um, someone I consider a mentor because she went to IUPUI. She did the same thing as me, and she went to IU Bloomington for her master's. And then we talked, and she connected me with a few different people in the IU Bloomington program. Mm -hmm. So I talked to them, and I even had a phone call with them just so I, yeah. I learned what is, like, in their program and stuff like that, what um, financial aid they have available because finance, finance is very important too in education in the U.S. So I also talked to people here at IUPY. Um, I talked to a couple of graduate students. Um, they also connected me with others. You know, I talked. And then I was referred to one of the professors. Everybody loved him. His name is Dr. Terman. And then I talked to, before I talked to Dr. Terman, I talked to another professor. I went to her office. It was nice, but it wasn't what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> and then I was like, okay, let me just meet this Dr. Terman and see what he is about. And I went and I met Dr. Terman. Oh my God, he, he was like the warmest welcome ever. And I sat in his office and he just was like, so passionate about public health, you know, and he's just like telling me, all his stories and telling me all the opportunities I have. He talked to me about his connections and and then he talked to me about maternal and child health. I knew that I wanted to help, you know, people at some point. That's why I chose social and behavioral science. But I didn't I didn't know I wanted to be in maternal and child health until I spoke to him, you know. Because I had done a project a long time ago in undergrad. It was about fetal alcohol syndrome where like 
there are like mothers that drink and then their children have problem. And I, I was like, I want to work for ch- with children too. And so when he talked to me about how in order for me to work with children, I have to work with their mother. And I was like, I was just sitting looking oh, at him. I was like, oh my God, this is everything. And so I was like, I think I'm going to stay here because I really want to work under Dr. Terman and kind of learn, you know, learn from him. And he's my current advisor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's very resourceful. He has a lot of connection. He's a professor in Morocco. Okay. Yeah. So I was like, I'm just going to stay here. But I knew all the time when I posted on social media, I knew I was going to stay here. <laughs> a lot of my friends are like, we know you love IUP. Right? There is no way you're going to Bloomington. I was like, okay. But everyone was so curious. Everyone wanted to know yeah. when I posted it because I had friends at IU Bloomington. All of them voted IU Bloomington. Yes. All my IUP friends voted IUP. I was like, okay, you'll see. And so once everything was finalized, I was like, okay, it's almost school is almost coming. So I'm just going to do it a big revelation (laughs) no that's good and it i mean it's like like you stated at the beginning it's about creating those connections and that's what makes you feel comfortable yes and yes it has worked for you yeah and on top of that it was a good thing that i stayed at iupui because i had applied to be a social justice scholar because it's a program that undergrad, grad student, and PhD student can do. Okay. And then I applied, and the graduate assistant that last year dropped, and I guess she got another job somewhere. And I was the closest person to becoming a graduate assistant because I'm in grad school, mm-hmm. and he pays for my school. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and then when the director emailed me, I was like, hey, I saw that you're in grad school. Will you be interested? Um, in interviewing for this position, or mm-hmm. so I was like, yes, it's like meant to yes. be. Yes, <laughs> so it was like very because they had already interviewed me, mm-hmm. so they didn't really like do another interview. They just like take me and yeah. Wow, it was just meant to be. <laughs> I know for you to stay here. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit more about home and. I guess what it means to feel like you're at home. I have like a series of questions that um, I was just thinking about home can be a lot of things. Yeah. But if we start to think about um, maybe have you been able, and I know that you have this project where you have your Instagram about cooking. Yes. Um, is it Tanti? Yeah. Tanti mean aunt. Tanti. <laughs> Tanti Marianne's kitchen. <laughs> it does. It means Aunt Marianne. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's real. You're really good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but have you had any food here that maybe you don't cook or yeah, that your mom doesn't cook that tastes like home? Or have you been able to find it? My mom doesn't. My mom only cook African. She only cooks African food. So, sorry, can you ask one more? No, just if you've been able to have food here in Indianapolis that reminds you of home? Yes, I have. I have, actually. Um, I have another friend. Um, she's Burmese, like Ebuna. Uh-huh. We met here at IUPY. So she takes me to a Thai a restaurant, and I had, um, it was like a fish stew with rice. It tasted just like at home. And I had once also went to a Vietnamese restaurant. The food tasted a little bit like home. <laughs> It's funny how we connect a lot through yes. food. Yes. And there's food from Thailand and yeah. Burma that tastes just like yes. something maybe your grandmother would make. Yeah, and it's so crazy because they cook it differently. <laughs> but <laughs> what, was it like the main ingredient? Um, for like the Thai food, the main ingredient was fish. You know, we all had the fish. Yes. But the way they cook it, it's different from the way we cook it because you could see the tomatoes and like the ingredient. But yeah. us... We blend all those stuff together, but it still tastes the same. I'm like, I don't know how. That's why I love tom yum soup. Yes. Because it's also, we make similar soups, but we, we don't call it We were just talking tom, about yeah. tom yum soup it's with so, lemon. So you have lemongrass too? <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> lemongrass and is it garlic and yes. tomatoes. And they put the little mushrooms. And... Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to make tom yum for your channel. I've actually never made it, you know. And like with my channel, one thing I'm open is like um, you can never finish learning how to cook. So I try to go to my friends so they can teach me. You know, my next stop is Indian food because I really love Indian food. Okay, so we'll see if when when <laughs> it's featured at Auntie Mariam's kitchen. Um, what about 
music? What music reminds you of home or is there a specific song? So, yes, um, I actually listen to a lot of, um, I don't really listen to, I'm not like a regular person, well, I don't think a regular person do this, but it's like in general, my generation listen to rap and stuff like that. Yes. I'm not like that. I don't listen to stuff like that. I listen to a lot of, you know, musics from home. I actually listen to a lot of Latinx music. Okay. I listen to a lot of African music. Um, I listen to Italian music. <laughs> do so um so most of the song that i listen to are love song uh-huh. i'm not like in love or anything i just love love songs yes. <laughs> so a music that reminds me of home or i guess a song that when you hear it it just takes you back home a lot a lot even last night i stayed up till 3 a.m. just listening to old music. <laughs> and what are some of those? Or who's, so who are some of the Some things? of those are, let's say, they're like some of, some of the artists are from France. Um, one of my favorite, his name is Matt Pokora. I really, really love him. And there are other from Guinea also. Mm-hmm. Like we have one called Sekuba Bambino. He, he sings very well. Every time his songs come, it just reminds me of home. And there is another one that I really, really like. His name is Sally. Keta, and he's really known really internationally, but he's not from Guinea. He's from Mali. Okay. Um, but he's very popular in Guinea. So, yeah. So is are these um, people who, if you play it with a room full of people from Konarki or from Guinea, they'll know the songs? Yes. yes. And it, it'll just, yes. everyone will sing. Yeah, everyone will sing, everyone will dance. <laughs> <laughs> so they're more dance, dance type yes. songs. Th- yes. These are not like ballads or romantic songs. Um, not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. African people just like moving, jumping, you know, <laughs> you know, African dance is a workout. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's a workout. <laughs> yeah. What about, um, a drink that mm-hmm. reminds you of home? Um, Fanta. But Fanta the here orange? tastes different. Yes. Orange yes. Fanta. <laughs> In the little, um, like bottle. The glass. The glass. It's totally different. <laughs> it tastes different here. And even Capri Sun. I love Capri Sun, but I don't love, I don't, when I'm in Guinea, I buy packs of Capri Sun. I drink at least, probably not, I don't know if it's healthy or not, but I drink probably like five Capri Suns a day. But here, I don't like it. It's different? It's very different, and especially the Kool-Aid Capri Sun. <laughs> I don't drink it. I don't drink Capri Sun here. But when you go home? When I go home, everybody knows me as like, do they have the Capri Suns ready for you? Yes. <laughs> Cold. Yes. yes. And even the guy at the where I buy the store, he knows me. Do you have when, do you have like the little corner stores like we do yeah, in Mexico? We, do. <laughs> yeah. we call them boutique. Oh, boutique. Yeah, we call them boutique. We just call it like La Tiendita, which means the little store or oh, the corner store. Okay. Yeah. We call them boutique. So they know you when you go. Yes. That you want your yeah. Capri Sun. Yes. But if, are they the same brand? Um, probably not because most of ours are either made in there in our factories or it is imported from Middle Eastern countries. I don't know. I do see that there's like Arabic writings on them. So I'm not sure exactly where it is coming from. All I know is it is good. (laughs) And Fanta. Yes. But the Fanta you can find here or it's still not the same. Fanta is here. It's, it's different. I mean, the glass Fanta is definitely, I don't know if it's because it's in the glass, (laughs) 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 but I feel like Fanta is different. And re- another reason why I love Fanta is because my mom's name is Fanta. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another reason why I like Fanta. No, but it has to be the orange Fanta in the glass container. I like the yellow Fanta, the cocktail. Oh, I don't think. Yeah, we had that in Guinea. It's also in the glass. Uh-huh. It's yellow. It's a, it, we call so it- when you say Fanta, it's not orange. It is orange. There is orange. But, but is your favorite. The, my favorite is the cocktail Fanta from Guinea. Which is that yellow. they have in Guinea. Yeah. Which we don't have here. I never seen it here. Oh. I've seen the orange one. It's all it's like everywhere. Yeah, the orange ones everywhere. Yeah. And I think we have grape. Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know when I'll get to try the cocktail. <laughs> it's yellow so good. One. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> um what about a site when you that reminds you about home? Like something that you see. Um I don't know if you when or when you get to Guinea when you visit as soon as you see something, you feel it right at home that maybe you don't have here? Uh, so I would say, you know, 
almost everything when I'm in Guinea, I know that I'm in Guinea. Yeah. Because like you see people on the street, you know, you see vendors selling food, you know, yeah. it's like the vibe, you know, it's always like people are not just like work home, work home, work home. Mm-hmm. People go out and interact, you know. So I think the vibe and like something I didn't embrace when I used to live in Guinea was like visiting the country, like, you know, different Oh, different parts, not Part. just, not conarchy, but, yeah, but the like surrounding. The surrounding and also going to places where there are like, uh, I call it, touristic places. But when I went this time. When you go back now? Yeah, like in December when uh-huh. I went, I visited a lot of places. That you had never visited? <laughs> that I never visited when I was there, you know. Mm-hmm. I even went on an island. You have to take a little boat. Um, it's not a boat. I forgot. A ferry. That. Yeah, it's not. It's like a small. It's not mm-hmm. a big ferry. But like you have to take that to get to the island. And I didn't tell my grandmother. Otherwise, she would be like, "No." Why? <laughs> she's. They're very protective of us. And then she's. She's like, people died there before. I'm like, your time and our time is different. We have more <laughs> technology now, and you not. You don't have to. Being like you know those small boats for like an hour trying to get there. You can it's get faster. there in like. 25 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, so. Okay, so you've been able to experience things that had you stayed in Guinea, maybe you would have never visited? Probably not. Because like living in Hindi, I don't go to visit places. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I live here. <laughs> when, when I see people taking a picture, I'm like, okay, I should go visit this place. But I never go. I don't know why. But when I live at the place, I don't think about visiting it. But when I'm no longer there, I'm like, want to know what's, mm-hmm. you know, it's even Belgium when I used to live there, I didn't visit much. Yeah. But when I went to France two summers ago, I was like, oh, I want to go visit Belgium. To go to the places that you didn't <laughs> yeah. visit or yeah. experience when you lived there. Yeah. And how long did you live in Belgium? I lived there for almost two years. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Almost two years. Yeah, I wanted to go back, but I was like, oh, okay, I'm just going to come back because I had to take summer classes. <laughs> <laughs> what about when we talk about smells? What smells remind you of home? Um, So for me, any restaurant, like if I go to, there is this place in the north side. I forgot the name. Of it. No, here? Yeah, here. It's not actually in the north side. It's here. It's um, it's on the west side. I mm-hmm. forgot. It's actually a Mexican restaurant. Yeah. So I really, really love their food, their spices that they mix, or like, you know how at home we have these little. Oh, I forgot the name of it. You put the spices in it and you blend it. Mm-hmm. So like when I go to some of those restaurants, they have it. It's so cute. I don't, don't Are you what? calling the grinder the, the grinder, molcajete yes. with yes. the stone? <laughs> yes. So you yeah. have those in Guinea. Do we have big ones too. Bigger ones. Yeah, we it's, have like. I think they are are made out of uh, volcano rock, right? Oh. Yes. What are yours made out of? Wood, wood, or like iron. It just depends. Just and you grind yeah, your spices grind, there yeah. as well. Spices, rice. They have mm-hmm. big one where like two women stand mm-hmm. and they just go like. Oh. And then they have small ones where, like, if you're cooking in the kitchen, you just, like, use it. Yeah. So. And you have them here, yeah. too? Yeah. I have I think I use maybe it. I've seen you in your videos. Yeah. My mom is like, why do you use, it? use the blender? I'm like, but the blender cannot, you know, grind, grind up some of the stuff like pepper. You know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think, like, sometimes when you go to those restaurants and you see those stuff and you see how they cook, even, like, um, Japanese restaurants sometimes, mm-hmm. there is one in the north side. Yeah, that's the one. Like when I go there and you just smell some food, it's probably not the same as your food, but just the some of the smell remind me of like maybe back home. The method of cooking yeah. reminds you. Yeah, or like one spice that they use, you know. Like one specific thing that mm-hmm. reminds you. Because like for example, when I go to when we go to Walmart, you know, they have like a Latinx section. <laughs> That's where we buy all our st- spices because we use Maggie. Yes. We use Maggi for everything. <laughs> Literally everything. That's so, the chicken bouillon the ch- or the bouillon tomatoes. Or the, yeah. okay. So that's all we use. Since you have Guinea. to. Yeah, in Guinea, we, we they even have the you know the little cubicle mm-hmm. thing. So those are what we use. So like those smells when you walk through that aisle, it just hits <laughs> different. Yes. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariam. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you.
Hi everyone, it's Erica again, and you're listening to More Than a Place, a podcast brought to you by the Indianapolis Public Library, produced in partnership with Kendall Antron of the Made in Indie podcast. We couldn't tell the unforgettable stories of our community without your support. Thank you for spending your valuable time with us. To keep learning about indie immigrant leaders like Miriam, visit indiepl.org slash more than a place. Thanks for listening.